Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. That was an important presentation by Jim Clifton a minute ago with a lot of very sobering information. Before I get started on my remarks, uh, let me first congratulate President-elect Trump and Vice President-elect Pence. I think the caliber of the cabinet nominees to date is quite reassuring given the many economic challenges that the United States faces today. Our economy has been growing too slowly, as the presentation just before us certainly underscored. Our national debt has increased from 63 percent to 105 percent of GDP just since 2007. The U.S. now owes, again, as Jim mentioned a moment ago, almost $20 trillion, and this is projected to grow. Federal investment is at the lowest level since the late 1940s as a percentage of GDP. Net business investment is subdued. Infrastructure is deteriorating. Protectionist tendencies are increasing here and abroad. And the election results certainly show that too many people feel they're being left behind. Some blame these problems on trade, but the facts indicate otherwise. History shows clearly people have always wanted to travel and trade. And today that desire is stronger than ever. With our constantly growing digital economy, anyone with a mobile phone can reach new markets in nanoseconds funneling tremendous digital connectivity into more buying power, economic growth, and a higher standard of living. FedEx is at the nexus of global trade. We move 12 million shipments every day, serving 220 countries and territories, so we see the value of trade every day. In fact, although as Jim said, we're not up to the par with our friends in Nashville, the largest clearance port of entry in the United States of America is the Memphis airport, where our FedEx super hub is located. So we at FedEx are passionate about supporting trade, and we consider all FedEx jobs to be trade jobs. We have over 450,000 team members around the world who help enable the supply chains of companies from the United States to Uganda, from Singapore to South Africa. We know that trade means more markets and greater opportunities for U.S. companies, especially small and medium businesses, which comprise about 97 percent of U.S. exporters. Based on what we've seen over the past 40 years at FedEx and beyond that from 20th century history, we know several things to be true. Centrally planned, government-directed economies simply don't work. They can't sustain growth. They can't respond quickly to changing market conditions. They innovate more slowly, and they don't attract much foreign investment. Look at what's happened in socialist Venezuela. When the price of oil, Venezuela's main export, was in that all-time high, the government used its revenues to fund massive social programs without investing to diversify its economy. When oil prices dropped, the country had to discontinue most of those social programs and could not even afford to import basics such as milk and eggs. Grocery stores shelves stood empty and citizens stand in lines to get basic food rations. Protectionism doesn't work either. A November 25th Wall Street Journal article examined the impact of Brazil and Argentina's protectionist policies based on high tariffs and promotion of domestic production over imports. Such policies have indeed created factory jobs, but they've come at great cost to consumers who pay higher prices for goods and to taxpayers who foot the bill for the subsidies. The article notes, taken together, these measures essentially transfer wealth from society at large to a smaller group of workers. A December 2nd article in the New York Times did an excellent job describing global supply chains 
and U.S. manufacturing's dependence on imported content. The article discussed the reduced competitiveness U.S. manufacturing firms would experience if the prices of their inputs were to rise because of new tariffs. We have the best example of protectionism from our own history. The devastating Smoot-Hawley Act of 1930 raised tariffs on more than 20,000 items. This contributed to a 66 percent decline in world trade from 1929 to 1934. This misguided act of Congress ignited the Great Depression. In 1934, with the leadership of Secretary of State Cordell Hull, good Tennessean, Franklin Roosevelt overturned the Smoot-Hawley Act and established the trade policy the United States has pursued ever since, one of competitive open markets. History has shown repeatedly that free market economies create human opportunity. The post-war General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, or GATT, which sought to reduce tariffs and other trade barriers was a decisive factor in the post-war growth of the United States, which became the richest country in the world. U.S. trade policy was also a major factor in the recovery of Japan, Germany, and other devastated countries. Now, trade certainly got its fair share of attention in the recent presidential campaign, but much of what was said is inaccurate, and I'd like to set the record straight. First, trade is good for and absolutely essential to American prosperity. Trade is a two-way street in which both imports and exports are vital. Keep in mind that the U.S. exports goods and services. In 2015, the United States exported more than $750 billion in services. We also import products for other countries. Imports secure materials needed to create American products, and imports give our families more choices and lower prices. From 1960 to 2015, tro trade rose as a percentage of U.S. economic activity, according to the World Bank, from 9 percent to 28 percent. Even though we're the world's largest economy, 80 percent of the world's purchasing power and 95 percent of its consumers lie outside the United States. Our farmers rely on farmer, uh, foreign markets to remain financially strong. In fact, one-third of all American farmland is planted for exports. American manufacturers depend on foreign markets, with about 25 percent of all manufacturing jobs in this country being supported by exports. Overall, trade supports over 40 million U.S. jobs, or more than one in five in our nation. Tens of thousands of those jobs are at FedEx. Trade-related jobs pay an average of about 18 percent more than non-trade-related jobs. And in general, trade has added more than $13,000 a year in purchasing power for the average American household. The second fact about, about trade. Market access and e-commerce are changing the nature of trade. Thanks to the Internet and global logistics services offered by FedEx and others, E-commerce is booming. Worldwide retail e-commerce sales are approaching $2 trillion and are projected to exceed $4 trillion by 2020. While much of this is domestic trade, cross-border e-commerce will unlock even more growth potential for companies of all sizes, especially small and medium-sized companies. Let me just give you one great example of this just up the road, FedEx customer Origin Technologies in Rockville, Maryland. They develop RNA, DNA clones, antibodies, and plasmids used for research. Starting with eight employees in 1996, Origin now employs 80 in the United States and approximately 500 worldwide. And their network of international distributors reaches more than 35 countries. Fact number three, the U.S. wins when we enter free trade agreements. The U.S. Free, uh, has free trade agreements in place with only 20 of our trading partners. 
Contrary to public perception, the United States enjoys a surplus with those trading partners in manufacturing and has global surplus, surpluses in services and agriculture. According to the Department of Commerce, our 20 free trade partners buy nearly half of all U.S. exports. On a per capita basis, these 20 countries buy 13 times as many goods and services as other countries. That's because free trade agreements remove barriers to our goods and services and make our exports more competitive. These free trade agreements are the solution to trade deficits, not the problem. American workers and businesses need agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's an important step toward achieving free trade agreements between the U.S. and 11 other countries in the Pacific Rim. We're 100 percent behind TPP. This recently negotiated agreement will unlock more trade opportunities with these other fast-growing TPP countries. TPP represents more than 480 million potential customers for U.S. businesses. The agreement would eliminate 18,000 tariffs on U.S.-made products, thus increasing global demand for America, American-made goods. It will spur greater investment in the United States, which correlates directly to new jobs here. Our strong recommendation to the incoming Trump administration is not to abandon TPP, but to improve it towards full free trade, which President-elect Trump supports, with these countries. There was also a great deal of negative talk about NAFTA during the election campaign. But in fact, NAFTA is the linchpin of our current economic competitiveness. Here's what NAFTA does. It eases trade among 450 million people in the United States and our trading partners, Canada and Mexico. NAFTA trade more than quadrupled in 20 years, which boosted the economies of all three countries. NAFTA has made the United States the centerpiece of a huge North American production platform. Nearly 14 million U.S. jobs depend on trade with Canada and Mexico. Economist Gary Huffbauer estimates that NAFTA makes the United States about $127 billion richer every year. And U.S. private sector jobs have increased by more than 29 million, a 32 percent rise since NAFTA began. Of course, NAFTA was written in the 1990s, and the nature of trade has changed substantially, mostly due to the Internet and the digital economy. Modern trade agreements like TPP address 21st century trade issues such as e-commerce, cross-border data flows, state-owned enterprises, small businesses, and global supply chains. All these improvements, plus others in the areas of labor and environment, are included in TPP. If President-elect Trump wants to improve NAFTA, we recommend he start with these types of provisions many of which have already been agreed to by Mexico and Canada as part of TPP. The new administration may also want to address the advantage that Mexican exporters receive through the rebate of value-added taxes, or VAT, on all their exports to the United States. We don't have similar rebates on corporate taxes paid on U.S.-made goods, and this puts our exports at a serious disadvantage. While NAFTA could be updated and strengthened, as noted, withdrawal is another matter entirely. There are myriad reasons why that would be catastrophic for the U.S. economy, but the main one is the nature of American supply chains. Few people understand how NAFTA has woven the productive capacity of North America into one integrated platform. The United States, Canada, and Mexico make so many things together. Forty percent of the value of Mexico's exports to the United States is U.S. content. The auto industry is a great example. It's been said that the average American car crosses the U.S.-Canadian border seven times during its production. A November 10th Wall Street Journal article cited an example in which a seat had parts from four U.S. states and four Mexican locations. NAFTA makes the U.S. one of the most attractive manufacturing locations in the world, 
because of value-added productivity of both Canada and Mexico in one integrated North American supply chain. If we could complete free trade agreements with Asia and Europe, the U.S. could in fact become the undisputed champion in manufacturing once again. Withdrawal from NAFTA would have massive repercussions. Thousands of U.S. companies would have to shift their supply chains at great cost and disruption to their businesses. Americans should understand that pulling out of NAFTA does not ensure that production in Mexico would come back to the United States. In fact, it's possible that many U.S. manufacturers would either find suppliers in other countries or use Mexican production to export to other markets because Mexico has 40 plus free trade agreements, double our level. We've talked about TPP and NAFTA, but we haven't mentioned the huge economy that is part of neither of those agreements, China. The U.S.-China relationship is the most consequential global relationship of the 21st century. It comprises the two largest economies in the world, two economies that are highly interdependent. We have numerous common interests and challenges, and many of the toughest global issues cannot be solved without Sino-U.S. cooperation. For years, the bedrock of our relationship has been based on three principles. First, that China's rise is good for the United States. Second, that both countries must work together where we have common objectives. And third, we must manage our differences carefully so they don't spiral out of control. Those three principles are still valid and should continue to govern our relationship going forward. Both sides, however, have to acknowledge that attitudes in the United States are changing towards globalization, international trade, and China itself. Let's look at these changing attitudes crystallizing in the minds of American business leaders, policymakers, and the public who elect them. No one can reasonably deny that China's joining the WTO has brought about enormous benefits for China and overall the rest of the world. Having China inside the global rules-based system will always be preferable to having them outside it. China's WTO membership has brought great benefits and opportunities for consumers and companies around the world, including FedEx. It's also propelled dramatic economic growth and change in China. Let me note that FedEx strongly advocated China's entry into the WTO. It was the right call then, and it still is today. But it's important to note there are trade-offs, and many people here have been hurt by China's economic rise, especially in the manufacturing sector. When we talk about the manufacturing issue, it's important to note that not all our problems can be blamed on China. Much of the U.S. decline in manufacturing employment is due to automation and productivity improvements. Even so, U.S. manufacturing output was more than $2 trillion in 2015. We make things today with fewer people, and that will continue into the future. In addition, it's important to note our trade deficit with China is really a trade deficit with Asia and the vast network of Asian supply chains into China. Even if we imposed massive tariffs on China, much of their production would sh simply shift to other Asian markets such as Vietnam. Tariffs on China will not bring back large numbers of low-value added manufacturing jobs. Training our workforce for the future and reforming our tax code will grow high-paying manufacturing jobs here in a truly open trade regime. Protectionism will reduce them. But let me be clear, there are legitimate concerns about Chinese mercantilist policies that promote domestic companies there and their industries while restricting foreign competition. The list of troubling Chinese economic and trade policies includes the Indigenous Innovation Initiative, support of national champions, massive investment in state-owned companies, intellectual property violations, including cyber espionage and forced technology transfer. FedEx has experienced protectionist policies in Asia firsthand, so I know of what I speak. Both Japan and then China tried to deny FedEx our commercial rights. 
Japan and China did this trying to protect potential domestic competitors. Many other Western companies have faced similar forms of protectionism. Prime Minister Abe in Japan and President Xi in China are well aware of their own economic challenges due to protectionism in their country. This is why Prime Minister Abe has taken a strong stance in favor of TPP against significant domestic opposition in Japan. In the same vein, President Xi has strongly supported a more open and dynamic Chinese economy with a more consumer-driven GDP. Unfortunately, progress to those ends in China has been slow, as evidenced by recent increased support of debt for state-owned enterprises. While its growth in the last 20 years has been remarkable, China is now approaching the outer limit of investment and export-led mercantilist growth. History shows that China will not be able to take the next, more difficult step of transitioning to an innovative, higher-income country while still a state-run economy. China need only look at what's happened in Japan. Its mercantilist approach for so many years gradually slowed its economic growth almost to a halt. That's why Japan now avidly embraces TPP. A sustainable culture of innovation does not grow through government fiat, nor does it grow through state-supported acquisition of foreign technologies, brands, and businesses while keeping one's own economy closed. Instead, China needs to pull back from state ownership, reduce regulations, and move towards becoming a true free market system. Here are three recommendations regarding China for the incoming Trump administration. One, make the U.S.-China relationship a top priority to avoid a downward spiral in economic and commercial relations that would harm millions of people. This is critical. The Peterson Institute has modeled the impact on the U.S. economy from a full-blown full trade war with China and Mexico. The results are not pretty. It would throw the U.S. into a recession and cost us close to 5 million jobs. The president of both countries must commit to maintaining the relationship as we work through our differences. Second, we need to focus on increasing U.S. exports to China than restricting Chinese imports. We need more trade, not less. This requires the Trump administration to address both Chinese and U.S. policies that inhibit U.S. exports. Of course, we must be addressed, uh, prepared to address situations where China or other countries export to the U.S. in violation of trade rules. The Trump administration has an extensive array of tools to apply in those situations. Equally important, the U.S. should not ignore the services sector. Export services jobs pay wages that average 20 percent higher than the United States average. The U.S. enjoys a huge comparative advantage with a services trade surplus of over $250 billion. Private services account for about 68 percent of our GDP, but only about 50 percent in China, since so many important service sectors are closed. Opening these service markets will help China achieve its own economic objective of moving from an export-based economy to a more consumption-based GDP. The bilateral investment treaty that the U.S. is negotiating with China could give the Trump administration its first opportunity to get a better bilateral agreement and help China achieve its internal market reform goals. And third, we need to enforce our trade agreements and address policies that penalize the U.S. economy and our workers. But of course, we must always act consistently within U.S. law and WTO rules after all, as the U.S. has been the primary architect of a rules-based system since Franklin Roosevelt's administration. It's important to recognize blanket tariffs and posed across the board are not the right response. Such tariffs will erode support for the global rules-based system and undoubtedly unleash a wave of protectionist retaliation around the world. China should understand that under a Trump administration, there will be stronger and more rapid consequences for closed-door commercial practices. How China reacts 
will be critically important. All the while, we support President Xi's stated commitment to a more open Chinese economy. To these ends, we hope the Trump administration will take another look at TPP and realize not only its benefits to the United States, but also the consequences is if an improved version is not approved. TPP is the bulwark against current Chinese practices, and China is aggressively moving forward with its own trade agreement in the region, the RCEP, or Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Many TPP countries have said that without TPP, they'll have no choice but to move closer to RCEP. We urge the Trump administration to put a stamp on a revised TPP by addressing any concerns it sees and making any additional improvements to promote trade rather than restrict it. We also hope that other existing trade negotiations can be picked up and strengthened under the Trump administration. The two most important of these are the Trade and Services Agreement, or TISA, and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or TTIP, with the EU. Trade facilitation should be another priority. We've been promoting this for years. The WTO Trade Facilitation Agreement has now been ratified by 102 countries and needs only eight more to come into effect. And this will reduce customs and administrative costs by up to 14%, which is significantly more than the average global tariff. And finally, I would note that the Trade Promotion Authority, or TPA, that Congress recently passed has a detailed list of all the areas where the U.S. has a comparative trade advantage. We need to lean into those opportunities rather than to walk away from them. Now, finally, it's important to recognize that U.S. success in the world economy depends on three other changes. First, we have simply got to overhaul our corporate tax code. Our 35 percent corporate tax rate is one of the highest in the world and is inconsistently applied across industries. In addition, the United States and Chile are the only two, the only two major economies with a worldwide tax system. This means we tax earnings of U.S. companies anywhere in the world, making our goods more expensive overseas and our companies less competitive. We need a territorial system like every other advanced economy. This, combined with a lower corporate rate, will resolve many of the disadvantages I've talked about today and that were so central to the recent presidential election. A lower corporate tax rate in a territorial system will equal more investment, and higher investment means more, better paying U.S. jobs for American workers. Second, we must train our workers for the innovative jobs of tomorrow. A McKinsey study noted that in a few years, employers worldwide could face a shortage of 85 million high and medium skilled workers. So we should strengthen our trade adjustment and assistance programs to provide for retraining of workers impacted by global trade and automation. A large number of those jobs will stay in the United States if we adopt the policies I've mentioned today. And third, we must modernize our infrastructure. Unless we make major improvement to our roads, ports, airports, and other facilities, We'll lack the capacity to handle a growing economy and the global supply chains that support it. Our federal and state governments must urgently work towards modernizing our infrastructure for maximum competitiveness. Trade has made America great, and expanding trade has been a bar bipartisan pursuit for over 80 years. The failure to continue to do so would be a severe mistake with enormous consequences for America and for the world. Thank you.